Hello and welcome to day two of Lord Adversity Week here on Monsters of Rock, the Lordy Story. I'm your host, Matthew Kessie, and on today's show, we are speaking to the man of many personalities and voices, a very close friend of Mr. Lordy's, and an all-around awesome dude. It is, of course, Ralph Ruiz, and Ralph can be heard speaking on nearly every record since Babes for Breakfast and usually features strongly in the SCG tracks on the albums. And this time around on Lord Diversity, he, of course, adds his voice to many Ruizes rather than just the one this time. So I hope you enjoy this as Ralph and I jump into his experience of Lord Diversity. What was your first reaction when Mr. Lordy told you about the idea of Lord Diversity? And can you remember when exactly he actually told you about it? Uh, yeah. Um, he's like, dude, I've got this idea. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. He goes, I'm, I'm thinking about putting out um, one album for each song of the collection. He's like, uh, he goes, now that we're not touring, he goes, now that we had the, the fake the greatest hits, he thought it would be an interesting idea to make the albums that these songs came off of. And I'm like, wow, that's that's interesting. That's really cool. I'm like, I'm like, dude, holy shit, that's like seven or eight albums. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. So, um, when he said that, the first thing I was like, "Are you so? Are you going to include, you know, the songs that are on collection on these albums?" And he was like, "He's like, no, that wasn't going to be the idea." And I was like, "Oh, that's." I thought that was a little odd. I was like, "Oh, it should be on there, man. A little highlight again." But um, as time went on, and he started discussing all his plans and what he wanted to do, I was like, "Wow, man." And the fact is that the record label actually let him. I think that's that's amazing. That that's amazing. And then you think how hard it is for one person, even in a year, because of course this project already is about a year old into doing all the music to write. Ah, Christ, I don't know. Let let let's say seven albums. Let's say each album has ten songs. That's seventy goddamn songs. Mm. You know to like come up with 70 different ideas you know and that's hard enough in, in that span of time because jesus sooner or later you're going to start you know repeating yourself or like oh this material sounds like what i just did on this song but you know i i spoke to him so many times over like you know the past year as he was doing all this you know all different times of day and night he's like yeah uh, I'm recording the A&R album. I'm recording the disco album. I'm doing the uh, uh, I'm doing the um, the concept album. I'm like Jesus Christ! It was just crazy, and it was it was what was of course being on the inside was really cool because he'd always send me little snippets of uh, the albums on what he was recording, and I'm like, dude, that's awesome! I, and all the ideas and all the players that he's had involved super awesome um i really think it's going to be a great package and if you're a music fan of course like being a kiss fan i loved every single one of their albums even like you know some are better than the others now i look i'm like yeah it was a real shit album but you know <laughs> uh, i feel like okay there's a place in their history so Hopefully, I, I was talking to Mr. Lordy. I was like, you know, this might open up. I mean, granted, I don't think they're going to go down the disco route again, mm. but it might open up some different fans. You know, fans who or people who don't like that disco side or the hard rock side. And they might they might like the disco album, or the other ones might like the concept album. You know, so hopefully, it opens up to a couple of newer fans. And then also the diehard fans will probably understand the whole idea and the premise, what what Lordy were trying to do in the vein of if they were around as long as Kiss. And if they're Kiss fans, of course, they would know all the different periods that Kiss went through. So I'm thinking they'd be a little more open-minded to it. 
Right, right. And like this must like when you think about all of the the albums that you've already been on uh, with Lordy, you know you've recorded so many SCGs, you've done backing vocals and all of that. So you know before we go breaking into like your your role in this album, if you look and you compare it to the past albums you've done, what is that comparison there? Is there much much to compare? Or was it or was this an entirely different experience for you? Uh, this was a very new experience um, because in the past, well, it really sucks not having to be there to, to actually do it with them. Yeah. But and you know, there were times, uh, the last couple of ones, like uh, uh, Stereophonic. Uh, D, oh, Jesus. Uh, Mont Stereophonic. Yeah. You know, I did that in my bathroom, you know? <laughs> so it's not like I've got to be there. Um I did notice, though, on the last couple of voices, especially that I did for Lordy uh, Divert... What the hell is it? Lordy Diversity? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, that we started getting a little more elaborate with the voices and the production and getting it a little more, more radio theater than it was in the past. Right. So, and, you know, with... with with the regular albums, yeah, you know, we would discuss it once or twice and, you know, maybe a day or two and I was done. And this was just like, okay, it's February. All right, we're going to work on this. Uh, uh, we're going to work on this wizard character. Okay, a couple of days in that. All right, yeah, we'll call you in a couple of weeks when we're ready for the next one. And then after that, it'd be like, okay, now we want you to be a, uh, a reverend. Uh, okay, and blah, blah, blah. We would work on that. Okay, now we want you to be a redneck. And I was like, shit, okay, cool. So, and, you know, we just powwowed about the whole thing, but we'll get more to that yeah. as we go down. Yeah. And, like, when it comes to you actually doing those voices, do you get much of a heads up about what you were doing, or do you get phone calls say, like, right, Ralph, you're going to be a wizard now? Or was there, like, um, you, was it texting back and forth, like, we're thinking of this? Well, well, Mr. Lordy would give me a heads up, you know, usually a couple of weeks in advance. Right, okay. Um, let, let's say for The Wizard, which um, I think really that was the first one that I did, and that was for The Master Beast from the Moon. Okay, okay? So, so is that the concept album, is it, or the, pro, the progressive rock yeah, album? Yeah, I think the concept album. Right, okay. okay. Sorry for interrupting the interview here, but I need to give you a little bit more context before we push forward with it. This interview was conducted in August and Ralph is about to talk about the song Apollyon, which features in the collection timeline on the concept album. However, Ralph discusses here one of the ideas that him, Tracy Lip and Mr. Lordy were brainstorming in order to create an album based around and related to the story of Apollyon. However, that actually wouldn't happen as the story of Master Beast from the Moon centers around something entirely different and non-related to the song Apollyon. So really, what you're about to hear and listen to is Ralph giving detail about that original idea and not actually the story or concept relating to Master Beast from the Moon. Uh, there was no backstory. He didn't have a backstory yet for the whole album. He was like basically trying to figure out a whole backstory and concept from the song. And, you know, there were just little bits and pieces of the, of the song, like uh, uh, the universes would collide, um, the, the beast will, will arise, all these kind of things. So when Mr. Lordy goes, yeah, we're, we're looking for like a, like a wizard old kind of character. So I'm like, all right. So what I ended up doing, he didn't have any ideas yet. So of course, when he says that, I just, I, I first start off going on my own kind of idea. Hmm. <clears throat> so I was looking at the song and I was trying to piece together a story, <coughs> excuse me, that might, you know, work. And I, and I made it that, that there were two types of uh, races almost sort of like there was a, a movie in the early 80s a puppet movie called uh, Jim Henson's Dark Crystal yes yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so my idea was that okay you know this, the crystal was 
you know, split in half, and from there you got the good and the bad. And the whole deal was that they both were fighting over the amulet that, like they say in the, uh, the amulet uh, can't be lost in the song, and that that both of them are fighting for this throne icon where basically if if um, the the good side despised the throne because it, it symbolized evil, but they never destroyed it because it showed that they had won over evil, where evil wanted to capture the throne again because it, it showed that they were you know powerful and that they would reign again. So we were, I was just trying to throw all kinds of different ideas to flesh out a story. And then, um, then came the voice. And I started thinking... Uh, Tracy first came up with the idea. Uh, for, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Pink Floyd "The Wall" album, yeah, there is a little saying at the beginning, and I forgot what it is. Like I think it's like the show must go on, something like that. But it's it's almost whispered, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and the way. Damn it, I can't believe I don't remember it, but um, let's say it says the show must go on. In the beginning, it just says must go on. And then at the end of the album, you hear the same voice go, the show must. So it was almost like making it a, a loop. Right, okay. Kind of, yeah. So that was Tracy's first idea, that I was going to say a message that was going to be cut in, a, in, uh, in, in two sections. The, the end of my message, which was going to start the album, and the beginning of my message was going to be the ending of the album. Um, once that, once I started hearing that, I got the idea from another movie, John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. Yes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It was an 80s horror movie. And what happens is there is a radio... Um, there, there, there is a radio broadcast that's coming from the future explaining the events that are going to happen in the movie of like the coming of the apocalypse. And the only way that this message could come through is through the dream patterns of people when they're sleeping through radio waves. It's a really cool yeah. section. You can see it on YouTube. They show the whole radio transmission on how it was done. So that was the idea that I am sending out this message um, to the, uh, the against the master beast of the moon, looking um, that I am Ruiz, the retributor. I am a wizard that I'm calling out to this warrior to help us. So that's where I started getting the idea, and I started coming up <clears throat> with the voice. This is Ruiz, the Retributor. You know, made it sound like a very old, you know, worn, beaten down warrior. Yeah. Um, the the way that I ended up doing that was to keep that for a long time. Was I was actually in my in my closet. <laughs> with a blanket over my head to make it sound really dead and I was crunched over and instead of like taking in a very deep breath in so that I would fill my lungs with a lot of air so I could speak I hardly had any breath in my lungs so that it would be a struggle <clears throat> and that's how I got that kind of voice and uh, the other idea that I had for it was that actually my character, the wizard, is Ruiz, the retributor, and that I'm the one that started the war again between the good and evil because I hate peace. Because the only time that the character feels alive and is worth anything is when he's fighting and he's at war. So he's actually the, the bad guy in the story because he's trying to start the war again. So that was another idea, and you know, Mister Lawyer was like, "Wow, that's interesting." But that was the first character um, that I voiced, and um, probably a year or two earlier, I went to a Renaissance 
uh, festival, and I got a picture of me like in an old wizard's um, outfit. Nice. Which once once it gets closer to release, I'll send you the picture. Okay. Cool. The actual picture, because not only I'm on a whole bunch of albums now, but I'm actually on the cover of this one now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So he drew me as the wizard for the masterpiece from the moon album cover nice. so that i can't wait for that album to come out because that's going up on my wall yeah. <laughs> I, made, I made the album cover you'll have to get it printed onto a canvas or something like that oh absolutely <laughs> yeah. man i'm gonna i'm gonna go crazy with that <laughs> so so that was that was the first uh one i did uh, like the wizard um Rui, Ruiz the Retributor, another Ruiz character. Jesus, that's brilliant. And like when you when you actually look at all of these voices and everything, was that much work put into every single one of them or was this because it was conceptual that it needed that little bit more detail? Um this one had a little more because like I said, uh we were trying to get together and figure out a backstory. And I know Tommy ended up coming up with his own idea. But like, like I said, at, at the time, he had just thrown it out there. This is what we're looking for. Mm. So, you know, I, he's like, if you got any ideas. So, you know, Tracy was coming up with some ideas. I was coming up with some ideas. And he may have used, you know, aspects of what we were saying to flesh out the album to, to make a, a story. And, um, and what I did, too, was, um, you know, he, uh, Mr. Lordy makes the lyric tour book. So I started just reciting the lines of the Apollyon song in the wizard voice just to get an idea on how it would sound. And maybe he may want to use some of those lines from the song. So that was the most um, involved one because we were trying to come up with a backstory for the album. Nice. Okay. And would, when you were recording all of these lines um, for all of the albums, was there a particular way you recorded them? Were they, were they all over the phone or were they sent through like an iMessage or a voice recording? Uh, yes, they were sent. Uh, for, first I did it on my phone and then I sent it through, uh, you know, uh, Apple Message right. to Tracy yeah. and uh, uh, Mr. Lordy. And then, you know, we just started going back and forth. Some I nailed right away. You know, other ones I, I had a different idea what I thought the character should be. And, you know, we discussed it. We had powwows about each character. And, uh, yeah, this one got a little more involved where it was a lot more back and forth. And we broke it down more to, like, sections um, just to make sure that it sounded good. And, uh yeah, uh, the process was a lot more involved this time, which which I like. Like I said, it got to be more more theater this time around. Yeah, and I say you probably enjoyed that more than the yes the other ones. Yeah, because there's obviously a lot more detail and everything that go, like that going into it. Um, and in terms of all of the uh, these albums, like uh, it's probably fair to it's probably right to say now to people who are listening to the interview that you don't know where your voice is going to be put on these albums at this moment in time, which is in August. So um, it's probably better if I let you kind of go through all the voices that you did and then people can obviously, when they listen to the albums, they'll be able to tell exactly whereabouts their, your voice can okay. be found so um which after obviously master beast that's obviously the third album so that's 1981 that's the progressive rock conceptual album right. what, what other voice came next or was it kind of a mix um, match? i think um for the disco album the disco album so far the only part that i know um that i'm gonna be on we did a little take on uh like the the girl answering the door, and you know she lends up all all three people at the door coming in having a, a crazy sex orgy with them. So once again, this was Hella doing the voice of the girl, and you know she's sitting in her apartment. The door, the the, door, the knock on the door, and the first guy is uh, Tracy as the pizza delivery guy. <laughs> Uh, and, oh, hot, sexy pizza delivery guy, and you know the whole the whole gimmick is bow chicka wow wow. Yeah. He goes in, you hear them. Uh, uh, oh my god! 
knock on the door the second time. Who the hell is that? And it, it turns out to be Dylan Broda, who's done many voices yeah. for the uh, for the band also. And he's like, uh, you know, in the L.A. stoner kind of, uh, I'm the pool guy. Oh, no. Oh, shit. Or was he pizza? God damn it. <laughs> it's been a while since I heard <laughs> One or the other. <laughs> I know. He's the pool. I think he's the pool guy. Oh, right. uh, yeah. I'm here to clean the pool. Um, yeah. Because um, it's been a while since I heard it. But, you know, he's got that stoner kind of sound to his uh, voice, which is awesome. He does it fantastic. And then, you know, bow, chicka, bow, wow. Oh, he goes in. And, of course, third knock. Who the fuck is at the door? And as I bust in, I'm not the, I'm not the cool guy. I'm not the sexy guy. I'm the monster. <laughs> oh, my God. And I just come in, bow, chicka, bow, wow. And I kill everyone again. <laughs> so I think that one's going to be the disco album. Right. Okay. Um, after that... Um, we did a carnival barker voice one of these come right in come everyone see all the craziness at the three ring circus holes all that kind of stuff so that one got a lot more fun this one i actually did uh in the break room of my other job because we wanted to have a little more echoey kind of sound right so um we, me, Tracy, and Mr. Lordy were coming up with some ideas for that, and uh, I, I started a little less manical in the voice, and then we started messing around with the fact of, I almost kind of made it sound almost like the... The uh, the Crypt Keeper from Tales from the Crypt. It was an it was a show in the nineties on HBO. It was like an anthology kind of horror half uh, forty five minute horror show. Right. And it was a puppet. And the Crypt Keeper kind of hey ghouls and girls, we've got a story for you tonight. That kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, so I I kind of went off with that and. Um, Let's see if I have, um, oh yeah, I have the, kind of the script right here. So this is me, I would be standing on a, a pedestal, and I'm going, come on, come on, step right up and see the most horrific, stupendous, sadistic collection of macabre, freaks, geeks, and oddities, Scarby, the schizoid doll, monster of all monsters, the ancient mummified assassin, the minister, oh, sinister, the rep troll, you won't believe your eyes, that's not all, but there's much more for you meaty mortals, see, the tallest man beast from the galaxy, far, far away, so something like that. That. The cool thing about this also is, is that during this time, Mr. Lordy actually got to meet the new Finnish actor that plays Chewbacca in the new Star Wars movies. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, cause <laughs> yeah. No, so, he was actually able to get um, the actor. I forgot his name in the studio to do the Wookiee, oh, you know, that, that uh, yeah. groan. So that line, see the tallest man beast from a galaxy far, far away, that is to an homage to let people know, you know, we, we got Chewbacca in, on, the, on the record. Jesus, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really cool. Um, so that, that was another one. Uh, and that's the Carnival Barker, and I'm not sure what album that is going to be on. Right. Um, yeah, because I'm looking at the names here of the albums, and it could be a couple of them, because like Amusement Park, which is the heavy rock album, and then this. Oh, that's probably going to be it. Yeah, because I know there, there's that one, and then Spooky Sex Travaganza Spectacular, which is the industrial metal one. But I'd say, judging by your voice there, I'd say probably Amusement Park is probably where that one fits in. Right. Yeah. So, um, what was the next then, one then after that then? The next one I'd probably
probably think was, you know, and I don't, I don't think we gave this one a, a character name, so I don't know if this one's Ruiz. It's probably Carnival Barker or whatever. Mm. But the next one was <laughs> Reverend Ruiz. Ah, he returns again. <laughs> yeah, no, no, th th that oh, was Father Ruiz. Sorry, now Reverend. yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the Reverend part was more. Um, like the TV evangelist. Right, okay. Deal. So when when they started thinking about this idea, you know, because I'm used to that kind of stuff being here in the States, all that Southern, yeah. um, those crazy guys dancing around. So like when I God first channel. started um, coming up with ideas, I mean, I was way over the top. Uh, almost something like... Uh, Let's see, I got some of it here, okay. Reverend Ruiz, something like, Woo-wee, that's right, mothers and sisters, <laughs> we are on the final hour to keep those donations coming. <laughs> oh, loudy, 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 I am on the rock and roll Reverend Ruiz, <laughs> so let's get ahead and rock out. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff, where yeah. it's so much over the top, Oh, uh, Jesus Christ. It sounds like they've done three pounds of cocaine <laughs> and they've been for 48 hours and they're just, ah, ah, no, Jesus. Oh, yeah, we're going to get the demon. Ah, all that kind of stuff. So that that was my first idea. So I started um, get, um, some of the script that they gave me. Um, I started reading it that way. It was really over the top and enunciating crazy words and adding it. <laughs> Because you would always hear that. That was like um, these southern guys, just it was their weird way of getting their point across. And after every sentence, it was something like, <laughs> shit like that. So um, when they heard that, they're like, that's cool. And it's like, it's a little too over the top. We're looking more like the, the softer, quieter um, TV evangelist, almost like a, a Jim Swagger kind of character, which was a big name here in the States. So, you know, once again, we started uh, going back and forth, um, reading a couple things. And, uh, yeah, with the holy thing, let's see, I've got some of it here. It, it was more of a quieter, subdued, and laid-back reverend, you know, trying to get people in, almost like, brothers and sisters, we really need your help. So I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I want you to feel. I want you to put your hand to the TV. I want you to feel and take my hand. Can you do that for me? So I'm bringing the people in more of an uh, enticing kind of way than being uh, over the top. Right, okay. Uh, that, that, that was the way... Um, that I did that in the name of Lordy. There is no place in your house for this damnable rock music. We must expel the demon, burn fire, all that kind of stuff. Really get into it, the vibrato, and then bring it back down. I want you to put your hand to the TV and feel my power, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, wants to do that and you put your hands to the tv what can it hurt and bang all of a sudden the tv starts to electrocute me and father reverend ruiz is dead <laughs> <laughs> so that one that one was a lot of fun we were doing a lot a lot of back and forth youtube videos on you know the reverends and and all those kind of tv evangelist kind of people to to get a couple of ideas to go off of and um yeah that that was a lot of fun doing that one yeah it sounds like it. <sighs> jesus that's a lot like um yeah. what what came next then after doing that one then uh, after that, I think it was my last one, which was Rufus the Redneck Ruiz. Now, this one had been, this character, me and Mr. Lordy had been talking about for quite some time. Somewhere down the line, he wanted to do a redneck character. So, this really came at a really cool point to do this. 
So what ended up how how this ended up coming about was um, we started piecing the idea together, and I came up with the idea that Rufus, the redneck Ruiz, the seventh, which I'll get to to that in a moment, is cousins with the Reverend Ruiz. So now this is the first time we have family members. Nice. Yeah. So the way this came about for Rufus the Redneck, number seven, um, first I was making him hillbilly redneck, backwoods, kind of dumb, and that he couldn't... Uh, the reason why Rufus the Redneck got the number seven is because when he was born, his mammy and pappy couldn't count up to one. <laughs> so, there was a show in the 70s called The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams. It was about this guy and his grizzly bear. And he had a friend named Mag Jack. And he had himself a donkey named Number Seven. So that's how I got Number Seven. Right. So, I'm really <laughs> named after a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. I did that whole little speech. Roof is the redneck number seven. So that that's where it got that it was going to be seven. And then what was funny was when we started putting all this together. I'm like, hey, you're doing seven albums. We could start tying in the seven. But uh, I think it just got a little too much of the seven. So we dropped the seventh part. And you know, once again, we started uh, listening. And watching YouTube videos of, of hillbillies and rednecks, you know, from Kentucky, Alabama. And that's when he was really more like, I wanted to be more Texan redneck. So it's not, not so much like this, but goddamn, almost a little more like this. A little more deeper, um, a little more angry because Texan, you don't fuck with Texas, boy. That kind of shit. Yeah. So I just started messing around with that. So we started getting the idea um, that the story is, um, you know, me being out on my uh, porch, um, Tracy being a reporter, also Dylan being a reporter. And they are coming to interview me because I've been having... Uh, disturbances in my cornfield that this group of monsters keep on showing up and uh, they've been trying to hypnotize my wife Ethel Ethel god damn it put your put your clothes back on get the fuck back in the house woman shit like that and if Ethel is hella um so the whole deal is that they are trying to find out what the hell's going on. So they, they come down to my come down to Rufus's house to do an interview. Um, and you know, they're I'm explaining what's going on um, with uh, these appearances. Uh, and the way that I, I went about this one was uh, let's see, I think I've got the I've got it here on my phone somewhere. Oh damn it. Okay. So that he would talk to him, but also that once he was done speaking his lines, he mumbled, which you would hear in the background. So, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the, the, the news guy would be like, so what's been going on here? And I'd be like, God damn, these monsters have been coming down to my house down in South 40, making bonfires and burning up all my corn. Goddamn crazy monster and kill all my shit. Goddamn voodoo bollycomb bullshit. Shit like that. I would I would constantly be talking. The main part you would hear, and then I was going to mumble stuff. Half the time, just gibberish. Yes. Yeah. But we wanted to make it where you can still understand it. And like, you know, um, Apple, God damn it, get back in the world. Put some goddamn clothes on, woman. God damn, what the hell's wrong with you? Your goddamn brother put a shotgun on my head, make me marry you. Now I hate the day I make you a woman, god damn it. You know, shit like that. <laughs> so the whole deal where that came from, also, I used, uh, there was a TV show here in the States called King of the Hill. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, back. Uh, the uh, the creator of that was the one that made Beavis and Butthead. 
uh, a, a 90s cartoon that was on MT- MTV. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, shit like that. One of the characters in that um, uh, cartoon was actually like the precursor to Hank Hill in King of the Hill. But on King of the Hill, there was a character called Boomhauer. Mm. And Boomhauer was this one guy, they would all stand around and drink beer. You couldn't understand a word that he said. Hey, Boomhauer, how's your day going? You hey, oh, damn time going, same, same damn and damn and magic. Ooh, that kind of stuff. You never understood what he said. But it was, I found it to be the funniest shit. <laughs> So that's where I got the idea that I was sort of going to do like a Boomhauer character for the mumbling, but you can understand what he's saying. So it's not a ripoff. And the fact that he's just mumbling, you know, you know, hillbilly bullshit underneath his breath, I liked. So, you know, once again, that one got a little more involved um, with the production, with the with the with the sounds and stuff in the background, uh, the cool thing about it is that it's it's um, it's taking place in the same area of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the town of Texas. Right. Nice. So yeah. we we use that, and then of course, you know, I, I I'm telling the uh, the the two newscasters to follow me. Let's go somewhere where we can talk all quiet. And when I open up the the shed, you you hear both of them go. You see that lampshade? I could swear that's human skin. So now we start playing into the whole Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where you know I'm opening. I'm not giving a shit. I just want to go somewhere that we can talk. And they're seeing a lampshade. They're seeing you know human skins, a torso hanging from a hook. And then this is when the uh, monsters come back. And I'm like, what the hell? God damn it. They're in my cornfield a seventh time. There ain't no way I'm going to let these motherfuckers get away with this. I'm going to deal with them the old Texan way. And you hear me pull up my chainsaw. <laughs> and I'm starting up the chainsaw, and I go chase them off into the field. And, of course, um, while all this is going on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I've been trying to get the demons out of, I've, I've been, Total. I gotta get into the roof. His voice, like I've been trying to get the voice out of the demons out of my wife for the last couple of weeks. I even took her to my my cousin. You might have known him. You might have heard of him, the Right Reverend Ruiz. So I make a reference to my cousin. <laughs> where that where that comes in, uh, there's a famous '50s uh, musician. Uh, his name is Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, and this is true. His his cousin was Jimmy Swaggart, who was a TV evangel uh, an evangelist, one of these um, uh, people like Reverend Ruiz. Mm. So I thought, cool. I was like, why don't we have a little fun with this and make two of the characters related? And I told him that. And he's like, oh, that's cool. So that's the first time that you hear any of the Ruiz characters has a relation. So that's where I got the idea for Reverend and Rufus to be related to each other. So I'm starting up the, getting back to the story, I'm, I'm starting up the, uh, the chainsaw to go into the field to chase them. And what did you know? Rufus, the redneck Ruiz, the seventh, gets killed. <laughs> Jesus Christ! All, all of this sounds absolutely amazing, man. Because like, there's so much detail and work on into these, and obviously from your own perspective, all of those little Easter eggs you're throwing in, references to different things that have given you an influence in some way to make, come up with these concepts. So, were any of those like really hard to kind of come across and to come up with, or were they all kind? Or were, were there was there always some idea in the back of your head for different things that were proposed? Um, as, as soon as Mr. Lordy brought up the idea of what kind of character, mm. I started thinking of how to approach it. I didn't have the voice yet. Um, but like for Masterpiece, for the wizard, you know, I want, like I said, okay, uh, half the times, uh, on, on all of them, really, um, he would just say, okay, next couple of weeks, this is the character going to work on. So... I would mess around for like a week or two and just 
to write down or jot down some, you know, bullshit monologue for me to start messing around with. Um, because I hadn't gotten any idea yet from Tracy uh, or Mr. Lordy on what's going to be said. But as long as I had something that, you know, hey, th- <clears throat> you know, I love my ABCs and my one, two, threes. I know I'm not going to say that, but I, I might have used that when I'm going, I love my ABCs and one, two, threes. Okay, that's the wizard. Uh, here's the redneck. I love my ABCs and one, two, threes. You know, shit like that so they can hear the voice and the cadence that I'm going to use and then we can go from there I'm like okay yeah I like the way he sounds keep that now we're going to start you know fleshing out an idea um, and then you know just trying to come up with different ways on on uh, how to how to make the voice and like I said with the with the wizard you know me crouching over and not having a lot of breath in my lungs make it made it a little easier to sound uh, really harsh and that I was struggling with, with with what I was saying. Um, and then, you know, saying the the one that, I mean, it, it was easy, the carnival barker, but that was the first time me going up a little higher. And like I said, I kind of used the mannerisms and, and the, the speaking of uh, the Crypt Keeper from Tales from the Crypt. The, uh, the Reverend, like I said, with that one, I... I as soon as he said reverend, I just ran with it, and I went that crazy, manacle kind of guy. And then they're like, we like what you're saying, but it's just too over the top, and we want it lower. Okay, and then I just started going back and forth. We had a couple of uh, pieces of um, of lyrics or words for me to say. So we, we a lot of these we broke down a lot more section by section. So, you know... Uh, especially for like the, for the redneck, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, part one's good. I'm like, okay, crap, I'm I'm driving. So I'd be like, all right, as soon as I get home. So what I would do is when I was sending all these pieces, you know, I'd be like, uh, okay, uh, redneck Ruiz speech part one one in my closet with a blanket over my head i am three feet away from the phone i get very in-depth of build-up because you know there were sometimes you have to remember i'm in arizona they're in phoenix they're in uh finland they're 10 hours ahead of me Hmm. so you know they're almost done with their day of of recording i'm getting something like at four or five in the morning and I'm like, shit, okay, they're not going to hear this till the next morning. So I wanted to be as precise with what I did. They're like, okay, we like that. Or it sounded a little too dead. Try doing another one without the blanket. Or, you know, stand six feet away from the phone. So I, I got very, very meticulous when it came to the all the sections that I did. And I explained the situation because you know it's not like i'm just going into a studio yeah. to do this i'm like guys i'm gonna be home in an hour um i'll, I'll do it again and, and but a lot of times we're lucky enough it was like two or three in the morning by me and um you know they were in the studio still so we were able to do it and um yeah we we powwowed a lot which was a lot of fun three-way calls and just started uh jotting down some ideas on on how we wanted to do uh these voices so this, this was really a, a really cool time that I enjoyed a lot more because, you know, like I said, the, the first couple of times um, we, we still had, or at least I had, I had a little more direction in a sense. Yeah. But now, they, you know, it was cool that they left it up to me. You know, Mr. Lordy's like, all right, like I said, okay, we need a wizard. And we're going to, we'll start in like two weeks. I'm like, all right, cool. Ben. I just went off, started mumbling stuff, just texting. Hey, this is this is an idea of what I got, and you know, a lot of times, okay, that's cool. Yeah, we can use that idea. So it, it was more, we were all on the same level, and we were all just working off each other. And like I said, you know, next albums, it's not like, well, I better be on it because I did all these. It's still, if he wants me there, fine. But if I'm there. I know I feel comfortable that I could just start 
you know, uh, adding my ideas in, you know, or he can say, oh, that's shit, we're not using that, you know, okay, that's fine, we work on something else, yeah. so, yeah, it was, it was really cool, and like I said, this is, this is the most uh, characters in one uh, recording session that I've done, so, oh, God, that brings it up, I think, I think I'm almost to, like, 10 characters, yeah. if not more now. Yeah, you must be and, at uh, least, yeah. 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 And I'm like I said, I'm looking forward to the masters, masterpiece from the Moon album because I'm on the cover. Yeah. I think that's fucking awesome. <laughs> and when you actually think back, like, because obviously you've known them since Ozfest in 07, um, mm -hmm. do you think it's when you look back on that and say before that time, did you ever think you'd be this involved with a band? Absolutely not. Mm. Never. Um, you know, being a guitar tech here and there, or like, like I said, even just being there, I, I was happy just being their pyro guy. And then when Demo, their prop guy, had to leave and go back to Finland, then all of a sudden they're like, "Ralph, do you want to do props?" I was like, "Holy shit, this is awesome!" Yeah. Um, then that, and then um, you know, me and Mister Lordy had planned on me getting in makeup and doing one show on the Ozfest tour. And we had planned it. We had a day off in New Jersey, and we were going to do it the next day, but that, that day off in New Jersey just became a big, drunk fucking fest. So that next day, we, we were not in any frame of mind to like do anything different. We were just like, let's just get this fucking show over with. <laughs> so on us, this had never happened. And then, you know, when they came back and toured with uh, Typo Negative, it just seemed... The right time and right place for Halloween of 2000, 2008. And, you know, when we did the show in New Jersey, the Starland Ballroom, that was the first time I came out in Mr. Lordy makeup. Nice. And I've been in Mr. Lordy makeup three times. That was the first time. Um, then when they did the... The debut, I think of oh crap, what album? I think uh, I think Hella just joined, so that was uh, the Beast, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they did it in Finland, I came out. I was doing photography for them. I came out in Lordy makeup, and then in Stereophonic, um, they did a show up in uh, New York further upstate New York where which is really cool that my friend Jet who at the time was a small little kid um, had heard of Lordy and I was like holy shit I, I didn't know that so he had never seen him live so his wife his, mo his mother <laughs> Brenda um, their father Jim and Ariel all four of them came to the show and I had been giving them like Lordy uh, memorabilia through the years because he was a fan and when I finally met them um, I think he was 13 he was wearing the Lordy shirt that I had gotten him so that was really cool and then I forgot which birthday it was for it might have been uh, to Beast yeah I think it was because we were at uh, Sony Finland and I had Mr. Lordy and Ox wish Jet a uh, happy birthday on my phone and I sent it to him and of course he was like holy shit that's so awesome he all his friends so anytime that I could uh, get them anything autographed t-shirts you know CDs and all kinds of stuff I was uh, I would always send them stuff so that that was really cool so they came to the show uh, they were finally able to see them live and meet the band so I, I was happy for them because I knew it was something they always wanted to do and I was happy that I was able to get them all together to meet the band so it was a lot of fun and that was the last time so far that i've been in lordy makeup right okay <laughs> like this is like it's so it's so nice to hear you're you're so involved with lordy as a band and obviously your relationship with mr lordy with tommy is very strong you have a very good friendship and you, you've spoke to me before about that and um, you've gone over to visit them and all that so yeah. Um, I guess all this COVID stuff has kind of been, you know, difficult in that way. In that you've have it's been quite a while now. I'm presuming that you have been able to go I, over to Finland or over to I, Europe to see them. Yeah, Is this? I miss Finland so bad. Yeah. I seeing them, you know. I, I I sometimes I wish, God damn it, I wish I would have gotten stuck in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe I would have been married to a Finnish wife by now. I'd be speaking Finnish. Who the hell knows? But yeah, as soon as I can get over there, mm. um, I, I'm really looking forward to going. And plus, also, we have uh, our friend Alara Rahumaki. Um, she's one. Of, she's the half owner of uh, Baja Kurki, which was the bar where they yes. did the scream. Yeah. Scream. Yeah. Her 40th birthday is next summer, and she's, you know, emailed me and sent me videos. He goes, I want you to be here for my 40th, so please, you know, try to get to Finland. So I'm, I'm hoping I'd like to get there sooner, but if not, I'm praying to God by next summer when her birthday comes around, I'm there for the bat. And, you know, that'll be great because that's going to be up in Rovanimi. So hopefully, you know, the band won't be on tour and we can all hang out and uh, just drink and eat and just have fun i i miss finland i really do yeah and when people actually get to hear this new concept and everything like that and hear the amount of work that you've all put into it remotely together and it's such a collaborative piece pretty much all of your scgs and that what do you want listeners and fans to take away from this concept and from all of these albums um well first off i know not every fan's gonna love every album Mm. That's just that. That's going to happen. Yeah. I, uh, I do hope that every fan or everyone that buys this just goes into it with an open mind and sees what the band was trying to create. Um, like I said, this starting with collection of fictional um, greatest hits package. So him going back and really broadening on the idea is a great idea not only that it really shows how masterful mr lordy is on different genres of music you know you know all the other albums yeah granted it's sort of like the kiss alice cooper ish kind of horror rock but you know i've i've heard the disco album and god damn it it's catchy as shit it it sounds like an ABBA album. It sounds like I should be wearing goddamn roller skates and having a, a disco ball above my head. And, you know, and, so, and some of the songs are a lot of fun. When he let me hear a lot of this stuff, I'm like, dude, you should do this song live because you can almost do like a YMCA kind of deal. Like the, the YMCA, for all you people who don't know, is a song by a, a 70s disco band called The Village People where you would put your arms up, make a Y, an M and a C and an A. And that was part of their show. You had thousands of people doing it. It's fun to say at the YMCA. It's a fun dancing disco song that you'd hear at almost every party. You know, you don't have to be 50 to know it because yeah. it's still on radio. You've probably been at a party or a bar mitzvah or a sweet 16 where they might be playing it. Um, but yeah, there were there was like one or two songs that I thought maybe if the fans get these albums and they know there's almost one or two songs off the disco album where he can actually do like an arm movement kind of deal. I'm like, hey, it's up to you if you want to do it. I mean, it's getting kind of, you know, really cheeky and joke, but it would fit for the album. So I, I'm, I'm really hoping that everyone, you know, give, gives it a chance. I, I think it's awesome. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different artists and guests that are on these albums. Like I said, we got uh, uh, the guy who plays Chewbacca. Also on the, I think it's the AOR album, he was able to get, there is a, uh, a Kiss, no, not a cover band, Kiss 78. I think they're called, right. where they actually sound like the guys from Kiss and they record songs in the vein of Kiss. It sounds awesome. And he was actually able to get those. I think he, he was saying he got those guys to do backups on one of the albums also. Right. So it sounds like Kiss, you know, is backing them up. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things that he really put in, into this this collection and the speed of what he put these songs out. Like I said, over the last couple of months, we would just be talking and he's like, okay, yeah, I'm working on the AOR album now, or I'm working on the, uh, the disco album. Hey, check this out. And he would send me a couple of cuts. <coughs> 
And then, yo, hey, what are you on now? He goes, oh, I'm working on the concept. I'm like, God damn it. You know, that's seven albums, man, in one year. And it is a wor- it's a world record. Yeah. And mm. I think that is the awesome thing. I'm like, dude, that's perfect. But he told me it's a world record, but it's not a Guinness Book of World Records. Be, and I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, because to be a Guinness Book of World Records, I think they they would have to get a license I think for each one of the albums. So, you know, whatever, twenty five, fifty thousand per album. Ooh, You're looking for a couple of hundred thousand dollars yeah. to make it a record. Okay. Um, I, I I I think that that's what you know, Mr. Lordy said, but since it's not Guinness, but it is a world record that seven albums being released on the same day. So I mean that is that is awesome. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting it. You know, I'm getting the LP version. I'm gonna get the disc version. Whatever. I'm I'm not I'm not crazy sucker fan who just likes to buy all the different versions. So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll be spending some money <laughs> where I need to to get it. <laughs> yeah, geez, I, I, damn it, I want it all. It's just it's, uh, it's just really cool, really cool. Yeah, and like it sounds like amazing. Like, and as as a fan, like I can't wait to just delve into it and just go like on an adventure through right. musical history, like and just absolutely delve into every single song there is. Like, and like we're only a couple, like what today's what the tenth I think today. We're only what uh-huh. ten, ten days away from from what Miss Lori was telling me. The first single, "Believe Me," comes out off the right. disco album. So like that's like it's not long now uh, from here right. that we can uh, actually hear different. that. Yeah, it's gonna be different, and I think that's cool. Instead of starting with a rock song, mm. why don't you throw them right into it? Go in the deep end. Let's go disco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, kind of too with uh, like beat of the honey that started showing a little bit more of of that side anyway. Yeah. So it, so everyone sort of has has, has an idea, and. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's it should be a lot of fun. Um, I was following a lot of the, the posts on Facebook. And, and what's cool, every once in a while, I would I would put my two cents in. And uh, the, the thing I like about that, too, is I've gotten to that point now where I'm also getting recognized by a lot of the fans or people in here. I'm like, yeah, this is me, man. I'm not bullshitting, you know. Uh, I'm not making stuff up. I'm not trying to, you know, you know, blow myself up or blow the band. But, you know, because they're like, I wonder how this is going to fit in. I wonder what kind of song this is going to do. I was like, uh, without giving, you know, anything else, I was like, look, I think you're all going to be surprised. And I said, not every fan's going to like every album. If you're a Kiss fan, you probably, you didn't like every single album you did and if you did you, you can rank which ones you liked more i'm like this this is what it's going to be with this they're going to open up different genres of music uh you might like them all is it just give them a listen because it's i said remember this this all started with uh a compilation of fake greatest hits so this is his idea to fill that in and i'm like right there that's that's a great idea to start with okay. yeah and like when it comes to playing live and like hopefully we get the tour with Sabaton which is set now for the spring of next year um, and hopefully all going to plan that still can go ahead um, as planned but like I'd say when it comes to coming up with a set list (laughs) for this tour it's going to be a pain in the ass trying to pick the songs that actually fit into that for him like yeah, you know that that's that would be cool. Like if they did something like that. If uh, if it, if they did something almost like where if you if you were able to catch Iron Maidens on the, their last tour, the Legacy of the Beast. Yeah, which was awesome because every almost every song that they did, they had the uh, either a backdrop or some sort of inflatable or some sort of stage prop that. Um, that went with the song. If, if you're familiar with Iron Maiden, when they did the Trooper, they had, you know, the big uh, uh, Eddie on the back on the backdrop. Eddie came out in the British uniform. Yeah. Um, when they did Light of Icarus, they had a big inflatable um, man with uh, 
with uh, wings, and Bruce Dickinson had two flamethrowers, and he like looked like he burned it, and it came crashing down. Aces High, there was a war scene. They had barbed wire on the stage, and they had a full inflatable size, um, um, I think, Mustang fighter that just hung over the stage. I know... Lordy doesn't have that kind of budget or they're not playing big arenas. But, you know, if they did something like that, if they had, you know, maybe the disco ball comes out for the, uh, you know, a couple of the albums on the disco album. Um, I would love to be involved with that in some way. I would I would love that maybe if I just came out as one or two of the characters, yeah. you know, and, and introduce like if they did something, OK, we're going to the next couple of selections are going to be from the um, or the, the Abusement Park album or some shit. And I could come out as the Barker, you know, if they're going to do maybe one or two songs off of the uh, Masters of the Beast, I come out as the um, as the wizard. Um, I would love that. I don't know if that that's a plan. I don't know, because I probably wouldn't be able to do it full tour. But hey, who the hell knows now? That was Ralph Ruiz, the master of voices in the Lordy camp. And I hope you enjoyed our dive into all of his characters on Lord Versity. And make sure to give Ralph your applause over on Facebook and Instagram. And huge thanks to him again for all of his time and everything he's done for this whole podcast as well. He's been brilliant, so he has. Um, and also make sure to join me tomorrow as I talk to Lordy's A&R manager, Jane Hamkrona, and I will talk to you then. Kitos. Monsters of Rock, The Lordy Story, is a True Metal podcast production. The show is presented, produced, and written by Matthew Kessie. Head to True Metal Pod's social channels to keep up to date with the production. <laughs>